Hey everyone, it's time for more tricky parts of calculus. This episode is about the history of the functions e to the x and log x. In the last episode, I introduced the exponential function and the logarithm and gave the best ways to rigorously establish their properties. There was a lot of great math in that episode, check it out if you haven't seen it, but a lot of it was from Euler's treatment of these functions from 1748, and some of the arguments were even from the 19th century. What I didn't discuss was how people came up with these functions in the first place. The short answer is that in the reverse of the way these functions are typically introduced to students today, the natural logarithm preceded the standard exponential function. We can date the natural logarithm precisely to 1614 in the modern era when it was introduced by a Scotsman named John Napier. I want to explain what Napier was trying to do and how he worked out the properties of the logarithm, but I also want to discuss how people might have developed the theory of these functions and see if history can tell us why this theory was developed when it was and not at some other time. It's really a fascinating story. So I'll start with this puzzling observation. Trigonometry is very old, dating back to the time when civilizations first needed enough of a grasp of astronomy to work out a regular solar calendar about 4,000 years ago. But although the exponential function is newer, the most common application of exponentiation, compound interest, is older than trigonometry. In fact, it's much, much older. There's evidence of primitive banks in the very first cities with agriculture going back about 10,000 years to the period called the Neolithic. These were cities like Jericho, Tel Caramel, and Catalhoyuk. Here's a map of cities from this period. Banking predates money to times when banks lent and stored seeds, animals, and grain. Banking predates writing. In fact, it is almost certainly banking which provided a need for symbols for goods, quantities, names, and dates. We know that the earliest banks issued clay tokens representing quantities of stuff. We have examples of these tokens with writing from about 3000 BC. Did these early banks charge compound interest on loans or give interest to depositors? That's unclear. Though, in the kinds of circumstances we're familiar with, compound interest is needed to provide the right incentives for all parties, so probably at some point they must have, the earliest written record of compound interest that we have is an incredible artifact. It's actually a cone made of clay with a cuneiform inscription. Today it's in the Yale Babylonian collection, dating from about 2400 BC. That makes it about 600 years older than the Plimpton 322 tablet on the banner of my channel that contains the earliest trig table. It's also our oldest record of a long war with border disputes and diplomatic alliances. It records the victory of Enmetenna of Lagash over the rival city of Ummah, two cities on the Tigris River in what is today southern Iraq. Apparently, Ummah had taken from Lagash a valuable strip of fertile land some two generations before. The army of Lagash killed the leader of Ummah, and Enmetenna demanded that his conquered foes repay the value of the land they had taken with interest. The land produced one guru of barley in their units, so at the rather high rate of one-third, or 33 and a third percent interest, compounded annually for 55 years and a few months, he arrived at the round figure of 8.64 million guru. Here you can see what the writing looks like. I'm fairly sure that here in the fourth column it says one guru in this box, and down in this box these circles indicate the really big number of guru. Some sources translate these circles as 40 times 60 squared, which is 144,000, instead of 8.64 million, which is 40 times 60 cubed, but the larger figure is more consistent with the timeline and known interest rate. In any case, 8.64 million guru converted to our units is 128 billion bushels of barley of almost 800 times what the United States produces in a year today. Of course the debt was not repaid, as it might have taken them millions of years to do so. What happened was that Uma eventually rose up and conquered Lagash instead, killing Enmetenna's son, and the feud might have gone on and on, except all the Sumerian cities were conquered by Sargon the Great of Akkad in the 2330s. Maybe what this example shows is that people did not like compound interest. Compound interest was the subject of endless political battles across time and civilizations. Often it was outlawed. Inscriptions tell us that the Bronze Age states of Egypt, Babylon, and the Hittites had state-mandated insurance rates. 
but apparently compound interest was bad for the little guy. If you're wondering, like I was, why didn't regular people benefit from compound interest on their savings, the answer seems to be a combination that often banks served only the very wealthy, and that at various times, instead of offering interest, banks charged depositors a fraction of their money just to hold it, possibly because the world was so precarious. There's evidence of a 1 60th charge in Babylon. So compound interest only favored creditors. All the Western monotheistic religions from the periods that followed had injunctions against usury, usually defined as lending with interest, though sometimes interpreted as lending at too high a rate. And of course, compound interest was especially evil as it was thought of as interest on interest. Ancient Rome had an extensive banking and credit system with interest rates set by the state, but it was simple interest, not compound interest, which was outlawed, and the rates seemed to have been set to be easy to calculate, not based on economics. Rome's collapse made banks disappear for hundreds of years, but banks sprang up again in Italy as early as the time of the Crusades, and they usually found ways around the laws against usury, but compound interest was only made legal in England in 1545, and then revoked and then allowed again, so that's why we find the first book on the mathematics of compound interest, Richard Witt's Arithmetical Questions, appearing in 1613. It contains tables very similar to the logarithmic tables I'm going to talk about by Napier and Burgi from about the same time, completely independently. But the issue of compounding more and more frequently wasn't asked, and only seems to have been brought up in 1683 by Jacob Bernoulli, as mentioned in the previous episode. As an aside, the ancient economy and ancient banking are huge and fascinating topics I really would like to know more about as a mathematician. There are so many problems people in the past had to solve that we solve with math, so I wonder if they knew more math than we give them credit for, or if they had some completely different way of doing business. How did they price insurance? Did they keep statistics? That sort of thing. I'd love if anyone can point me in the right direction. So I think it's also worth noting Exponential growth is part of the cultural lexicon today, but it certainly wasn't in history. Some of our best examples of exponential growth, like population growth, or growth in GDP, or progress in technology, exemplified by something like Moore's Law, which observed that the number of transistors in an integrated circuit tended to double about every two years, simply were not features of human society prior to the Industrial Revolution. Here's a graph of the human population over time, the average rate of growth from 10,000 BC to 1700 was 0.04%, an imperceptible rate, even if they had kept records, which they did not. I suspect that, to the extent anyone thought about it, life appeared more cyclical than progressive. There were periods of growth and periods of stagnation and death. This attitude was explicit in the writings of ancient Egypt. By the way, the population is not growing exponentially now. Growth has actually slowed to being approximately linear, albeit with large slope. Of course, also no one observed the growth of bacteria until the invention of the microscope in the 1670s, and radioactive decay is even later. What about physical phenomena involving exponentials, like the phenomenon of terminal velocity, whereby a falling object encountering air resistance proportional to its velocity converges exponentially to a limiting speed? Both the mathematics and the experimental apparatus to observe such a phenomenon were out of reach at the time of Napier's discovery. Galileo at that time was just realizing that falling objects covered a distance growing quadratically in time, which he confirmed by setting flags along a track at square intervals, and as a ball rolled down it made a steady rhythm of ticks. With the parabola for the basic model for the path of projectiles, eventually people observed that cannons, that is, once the cannons were powerful enough for drag to be significant, did not shoot as far as predicted, which required a theory of drag. Newton considered the equation of an object whose motion is resisted by a drag force proportional to its velocity in the Principia, published in 1687. At the start of Book Two, he correctly derives the geometric decay and gives an account of terminal velocity. Here's an even simpler equation of drag without the constant force of gravity, x double dot equals minus kx dot, or v dot equals minus kv. Today we would solve this differential equation using the fundamental theorem of calculus and our knowledge of the logarithm and exponential. Newton's account is very different. In his view, the equation v dot equals minus kv means that in each of any number of very small equal increments of time, the change in velocity is proportional to the instantaneous velocity. Since you can show that if a sequence of values 
A, B, C, D is in constant proportion to their differences, they are proportional to each other, the velocity must obey a geometric progression in equal intervals of time. This is actually the same argument that Napier gave 70 years earlier when introducing the logarithm. But at no point does Newton use terminology or notation for the exponential or the logarithm. He does mention how the velocity and time are related to the lengths on the x-axis and areas under the graph of a hyperbola defined by those lengths, as discovered by St. Vincent in the 1640s, more on him later. In 1701, Newton posited a similar equation in connection with his law of cooling. So these investigations would have led to the exponential, but they required the development of calculus to be further along. And it's worth noting something that the ancients observed, that the motion of the stars was more regular and perfectly circular than anything observed on Earth, hence the greater attention to and progress in astronomy before the advent of Newton's laws, though that's not how physics is taught today. There's another field of investigation that might have led to the exponential in the 16th century, gambling. Gambling was always around, but it received a major boon from the ability to manufacture more regular dice and the invention of the printing press for playing cards. Many of the top mathematicians of the early modern period were gamblers, Cardano, Fermat, Pascal, Demoivre. Here's a popular problem in gambling circles from the 1500s or even earlier. Someone bets his friend a hundred ducats that he will throw aces, or snake eyes, on two dice in some number of attempts. What number of attempts makes this a fair bet? If P is the chance of rolling two ones, one in 36, and the chance of failure is Q equals one minus P equals 35 over 36, then people realize that the fair number of tries N was when Q to the N equals one half, or as close to it as one could get with a whole number N. Today, we'd throw into a calculator N equals minus log two over log Q, but they didn't have calculators or logs yet. People did compute tables and use some laws of exponents to approximate the right number of tries, here, the thrower has the advantage for the first time at 25 tries. Here's a way to approximate the right number more easily. Set P over Q equals 1 over R. So the equation we have to solve is Q to the minus N, which is 1 plus 1 over R to the N, equals 2. Now suppose we approximate the expression involving R and N by looking in the limit as P goes to 0. So r goes to infinity and n goes to infinity so that the ratio n over r is fixed to be some value, say m. Then, by carefully examining the limit of the binomial coefficients, you get the power series we recognize as the exponential, the sum of m to the k over k factorial. If this analysis had been done by Cardano, it might have been the starting point for the exponential, but instead it waited until Dumoivre in 1711, who referred to this result as the number whose hyperbolic logarithm is m, because logarithms have been around almost 100 years, but it was before Euler's work on the exponential function. In any case, you get the solution by taking hyperbolic logarithms, m equals log 2, or n equals log 2 times q over p, which is about 24.3 in this case, which is good enough to find the right number of tries. What about how many tries before it's a fair bet to throw snake eyes twice? or three times for C successes. You can set the failure probability that of getting 0, 1, 2, or up to C minus 1 successes to 1 half. Again, you can take limits to get a transcendental equation for M involving the exponential function and the truncation of its power series. This was also done by Dumoivre in the same work, essentially finding that the limit of the binomial distribution when the success rate goes to zero but the tries increase so that NP over Q is constant is what we call the Poisson distribution. This result is named for Poisson, who would not even be born for another 70 years. That's the first appearance of exponentials in probability. Dumoivre also established the convergence of the binomial in the case of trials going to infinity with fixed success rate to the normal distribution e to the minus x squared, maybe a later episode on this. Also exponentials come up if you analyze the so-called martingale betting strategy. I'll link below to a great recent number file video on this, but it seems this strategy was only discussed at the end of the 18th century. So here's another particularly pressing problem from the 1500s that really required calculus and logarithms. 
Columbus's voyage began an era of sailing across oceans. It might be shocking to realize that nearly all voyages up to that point were made not far out of sight of land, even when traveling in the Mediterranean. The reason is it's hard to know where you are, and especially so when the distance is so far that the curvature of the Earth makes a big difference. The mathematician Petrus Nonius was the first to point out in the 1530s that if you travel in a ship at a constant cardinal direction, or room line, it won't follow a great circle, but it will make a constant angle with each meridian, resulting in a spiral he called the loxodrome. An analytical expression for the loxodrome was beyond the mathematics of the time, but that didn't stop Mercator from practically dealing with the problem in the 1560s by projecting the sphere onto a cylinder from its center, a transformation that takes loxodromes to straight lines, and then by uncurling the cylinder and cutting off at extreme latitudes, you get his famous map, which is still the most popular way to draw a world map today. The key mathematical question is, if you travel in a given distance along a room line, starting from some latitude and longitude, what will be your final latitude and longitude? For short distances, the change in latitude is just the distance times cosine alpha, where alpha is the cardinal direction. The change in longitude is more difficult because each circle of latitude has circumference, that of the equator multiplied by the cosine of the latitude, so the same distance east or west will cover more degrees of longitude the farther from the equator. This non-constancy makes finding the change in longitude difficult. That's the problem of meridional parts. The determination of the change in longitude ultimately requires an integration of the secant of the latitude phi. This is one of these elementary but difficult integrals requiring a very clever substitution to see that it's an area under hyperbola with antiderivative log of tangent of phi over 2 plus pi over 4. It's really remarkable that in an era before calculus, the mathematician Edward Wright in 1599 published Certain Errors in Navigation, containing tables for calculating the meridional parts made by taking what we today call Riemann sums of secants. It was only noticed in 1645 that Wright's table was the same as a table of logs of tangents obtained from Napier's work, but it was a complete mystery why. James Gregory was finally able to compute the integral of the secant analytically in 1668 by a clever substitution and making use of the then available knowledge of the integral of the hyperbola 1 over x. In the era before Newton, Fermat had been able to work out in the 1630s formulas for the areas under all power law curves except x to the minus 1, which defeated him. It fell to Grégoire de Saint Vincent in 1647 to show that the area under the hyperbola from A to AR is the same as the area from AR to AR squared, essentially by the technique that I described in method five of the previous episode. That implies that if you take A of X to be the area under the curve from one to X, then A satisfies the multiplicative additive property A of XY equals A of X plus A of Y. St. Vincent's student, de Sarasa, who must have been familiar with Napier's logarithm, pointed out that the function a was therefore Napier's logarithm up to a multiplicative constant. It was clear numerically that it was the same as the improved version of Napier's logarithm, which was 0 at 1 and had derivative 1 over x, which gave a strong indication of the yet unproved fundamental theorem of calculus. St. Vincent might have received more credit for such an important discovery had he not in the same book published a construction of the squaring of the circle by ruler and compass, of course incorrect. So those are all the directions which could have led people to the exponential function and the logarithm, but now let's discuss how it actually happened. John Napier did not set out to define a new function, but to provide astronomers and navigators with a useful table to calculate with seven decimal digits of accuracy. It's hard to imagine, but back then there were no calculators, and when in the 1500s people wanted to do calculations quickly, they relied on lookups to extensive tables. Remember that multiplication is computationally harder than addition. Consider this method of multiplying two numbers. Use the identity AB equals 1 fourth A plus B squared minus 1 fourth A minus B squared. To multiply A times B then, just look up the values at A plus B and A minus B in a table that you've made of values of 1 fourth X squared. This method goes back once again to the Babylonians and even these numbers were once called tables of logarithms. Alternately, 
because astronomers and engineers made frequent reference to trig tables, see my episode four, they could use sines and cosines for quick arithmetic. Using the angle sum identities and shifting terms around gives, for example, sine A times sine B equals one half cosine A minus B minus one half cosine A plus B. To multiply, for example, 0.68 by 0.43, find the angles in the first quadrant corresponding to these sine values in the table, and then subtract the relevant cosines. Using the angle sum identities like this to multiply is called prosthophoresis, and basically nobody does it anymore. By about 1600, the mathematician Jost Bergi came upon the idea of making a more versatile table like this. Suppose you want to do arithmetic with four digits of accuracy. Bergy began with the number 10,000, or 10 to the fourth, and then at each step he shifts the number he has over four places and adds it to get the next number, and repeats over and over, keeping only an extra four places, you can think about why. This he continued painstakingly until he reached the next power of 10 after 23,027 steps. I'm going to make a modern adjustment and move the decimal place over so that the table begins at 1 and not 10 to the 4th. This table is a geometric progression by the factor 1 plus 1 over 10 to the 4th, same as a table of compound interest if the interest rate were 0.01%. So actually, just to get a feel for this process, I attempted to make my own geometric progression table with the much more manageable rate of 1.01 or 1% by shifting by two places and adding over and over. I made it to about 2.01 in 70 steps, which is correct, uh, which is where I stopped. Uh, actually, I found that I had a typo at step 9, which makes all the later digits incorrect, but it's still very close. Going to 10 would just require a bit more than triple the time and a bit more care than I put into it. So getting back to Bergy's four-digit table, here's how to use it. If you want to find, say, the cube root of 3.6, you find the index of the entry closest to 3.6, which is 12,810, and the entry at 4,270, or one-third of 12,810, is very close to the root. If you want the cube root of 36,000, you have to adjust for powers of 10. 36,000 is 3.6 times 10 to the fourth. You can get 10 to the four thirds as 10 times 10 to the one third. So you take one third of 23,027, add it to 4,270. That's between 11,945 and 11,946, giving 3.3017. So 33.017 cubed is about 36,000. I give this example to clarify the exposition in Otto Toplitz's The Calculus, A Genetic Approach, a great book where I learned about a lot of Napier's work. But already for the scientific work of the late 1500s, four places of accuracy wasn't enough, and a few people like Bergy and John Napier set out to make the analogous table with seven places of accuracy. The trouble is that this takes a long time. Computing powers of 1 plus 1 over 10 to the 7th, it will take over 23 million steps to reach 10. So Napier was forced to take a step back and develop some theory. What I'm going to do here is follow the essence of Napier's thinking, minus the particular details of his version of the logarithm, which would confuse the issue. First of all, he figured out that you could make tables based on different geometric progressions of rates a and b, and then you could recover the index of a number in the base b if you knew the index in base a and the number of indices alpha and beta to reach 10 in both tables by the laws of exponents, so it didn't really matter what base was used. Then if you're free to consider any base, the key property of the index, or step function, is that it converts any geometric progression to an arithmetic one, that is, for any row, f of x, f of row x, f of row squared x, etc., all form an arithmetic progression, or f of row x equals f of x plus k, a constant depending only on rho, for any x. But then f of rho equals f of 1 plus k, but f of 1 equals 0, since that's where we start the table, so k of rho equals f of rho, and therefore, for any x and y, f of x, y equals f of x plus f of y. This, again, is the multiplicative additive property I mentioned in episode 5, in the first instance in which it appeared historically. If you compute the derivative of such a function, which is a notion Napier knew decades ahead of his time, not by that name, but which he understood as a velocity, using modern notation, the difference quotient limit is the limit of 1 over x times f of x plus h over x divided by 
x plus h over x minus 1. That's 1 over x times an expression that doesn't actually depend on x, just the ratio y equals x plus h over x. So as y goes to 1, the limit, if it exists, is just some constant c independent of x. By declaring his interest in the particular function for which the constant c was equal to 1, Napier introduced the natural logarithm. So that's how Napier arrived at a natural logarithm, but what did he use it for? His goal was to make a trig table with logarithms of sines or cosines so that trig functions could be multiplied quickly with seven digit accuracy. More on why that was important later. Napier's table had an entry for every minute of arc between 0 and 90 degrees or 5400 entries. There's that factor of 60 again that we inherited from the Babylonians. Note that this is much more practical than making a table with 23 million entries. Here's how we could make a table like Napier's. First, make tables of geometric progressions for reference values. Start at 1 and multiply by 1 plus 1 over 10 to the 7th over and over, but stop at a round value, say after 100 terms, when you reach 1.0000100000. Four nine five and so on. That's very close to 1 plus 1 over 10 to the fifth. We're not going to forget that it's not exactly 1 plus 1 over 10 to the fifth. We'll account for the difference later. But for now, start a second table with 1 plus 1 over 10 to the fifth as the common ratio and go until another round number. Napier went 50 steps to 1.0005, again, cutting off after the 14th place. Now you have to make another table with common ratio 1 plus 1 over 2,000, where now you have to shift four places and multiply by 5 at each step. This will take you in 20 steps to something close to 1.01, .01, and from there it's a practical 232 steps to 10. Then you can fill in your course 1.01 .01 rate progression by making a table that starts at the power of 1.01 .01 and increases by the next 20 powers of 1.0005, which will give you 4,640 reference values. To compute logarithms of the entries in these tables, it suffices since they're in geometric progression to get the logarithms of the first two terms since the logarithms will be in arithmetic progression. To compute the natural logarithm of the first progression, 1 plus 1 over 10 to the 7th, Napier needed another ingredient, a key inequality that allows you to approximate the logarithm. In one form, this inequality looks like log x is less than x minus 1 and greater than x minus 1 over x. Now, I already proved this inequality in a slightly disguised form in method 5 of the previous episode, but here's another proof that Napier would have recognized. The graph of his function log x lies below x minus 1 and above x minus 1 over x since all three functions are 0 at 1, and their derivatives are 1, 1 over x, and 1 over x squared. So it's clear which ones grow faster, though to make this rigorous you might invoke the mean value theorem. A second version of this inequality comes from setting x equals a over b with a greater than b. This can be written 1 over a is less than log a minus log b over a minus b is less than 1 over b. Of course, these inequalities are only useful if x is close to 1 or if a is close to b. With this inequality, you get that log of 1 plus 1 over 10 to the 7th is between 1 over 10 to the 7th and 1 over 10 to the 7th plus 1, which led Napier to simply take an intermediate value, like the middle value, 0.0000999999595. Now you have the logs of all the values in the first reference table, and you can use the inequality to compare the log of 1 plus 1 over 10 to the fifth to the log of the last entry in the first table, which is very close to 1 plus 1 over 10 to the fifth. So you get an arithmetic progression of all the logs in the second table, and you do the same for all the other tables. Now it's just a matter of taking an existing accurate trig table finding the closest reference values in the table to the sign value, and approximating the logarithm with the inequality. For example, here's how to find the log of sine of 48 degrees in 30 minutes. Note that I interchanged the notation ln of x with log of x. Contemporary available trig tables gave the sign as 0.7489557. The closest power of 1.01 .01 is 1.01 .01 to the 202. Note that we have to adjust by a factor of 10 to locate the value in our table. 
then you can go to the 200 second finer reference table and multiply by an additional seven powers of 1.0005. Now use the inequality to get a small range, approximate by the middle value, and subtract the log of 10, which is the final value in the whole table of reference values. Here I've tried to capture the spirit of what Napier was trying to do, but the details of his particular construction were different in several ways. He used a decreasing geometric progression rather than an increasing one. He took 10 to the seventh to be the radius of the circle and considered the signs as lengths working downwards with a logarithm set to zero at 10 to the seventh. So in terms of our modern natural logarithm, Napier's function was Napier log of x equals 10 to the seventh log of 10 to the seventh over x. Also, his analysis was based on the differential equation of exponential decay for the values as the indices progressed arithmetically, just like Newton's discussion of drag force. I'll include references in the description if you want a fuller picture of Napier's actual process. Here, by the way, is a page from his table. Napier's table of logarithms was published in 1614 and was immediately well received. Kepler might not have been able to devise his laws of planetary motion without Napier's tables and their subsequent improvements. Napier was prevailed upon by Henry Briggs to make new tables with the logarithm to base 10 to be of more practical use. So although Napier had given a construction of the natural logarithm, the details obscured the role of the base E. In a sense, Christian Huygens isolated E when he computed several digits of its base 10 logarithm in the 1660s, but a full description of E, its connections to logarithms and continuously compounded interest, had to wait until Euler. Napier died in 1617, and the details of how he constructed his logarithms were published posthumously in 1619. Incredibly, it only took until 1622 for William Othred to take Napier's tables and construct the first slide rule, a ruler marked with a logarithmic scale and moving slide to read off multiplied values by adding lengths. This was the most widespread tool for numerical calculation until the personal electronic calculator, and now hardly anyone knows what a slide rule even is. Lastly, I want to address why Napier wanted to make a table of logs of trig functions in the first place. It has to do with using the spherical law of cosines. The problems of astronomy and navigation require not plain trigonometry, but spherical trigonometry. Spherical triangles are formed by the arcs of three great circles and have interior angles marked with capital letters and side lengths, themselves angles subtended by the arcs, given by lowercase letters. In the 16th century, the spherical law of cosines was better known than the planar law of cosines. This law, and another version for angles instead of arcs, involved multiplying sines and cosines, hence the need for the table. These formulas were crucial for navigation by the positions of the stars, including telling the time or longitude by the hour angle, and to track the motion of the planets. Maybe I'll discuss this in a future episode. Thanks so much for watching. If you like this content, please hit the thumbs up, subscribe. It's also a good idea to hit the notification bell since my uploads are a bit sporadic. It will really help me to grow this channel. Check out my other videos in the Tricky Parts of Calculus series for subtle parts of calculus that are rarely covered, including difficult proofs and how problems were solved for the first time. I also do a podcast and videos with general advice and opinions about the world of math. Thanks again.